A. Bob Douglas introduce our speaker tonight. And I spent many happy times next to uh, near them both, looking at Lake Sonoma, looking through telescopes at Lake Sonoma. And uh, I'm happy to have Bob Douglas introduce tonight's speaker. I'm just going to read an introduction that uh, Linda prepared, and then I'm going to make a few remarks on my own. Uh, Steve Gottlieb tried to organize a small astro club when he was only 10 years old. In 1976, he finally got a 70 millimeter refractor. After getting a scope upgrade, he observed the Messier objects, and in 1978, he joined SFAA. He's one of the early members. Steve has been an active observer in the Bay Area for over 40 years. He is a contributing regular uh, editor to Sky and Telescope. Maybe you've read various articles by him. And he has written articles on advanced observing projects for 20 years. He recently completed a project to visually observe the NGC, or New General Catalog, 7,840 objects. And for the past 25 years, Steve and a group of professional and amateur astronomers have re-examined the early source material of the deep sky objects and produced a corrected version. And uh, a lot of telescopes uh, have built in uh, digital setting circles and the corrections that uh, Steve and the others worked on are probably uh, in any of those systems. Uh, tonight he will discuss the history of the NGC and give several examples of their sleuthing. Steve says, for me it's always been about the aesthetics at the eyepiece in a large telescope. Let me just make a few remarks of my own. Uh, I met Steve, uh, it was about 2003 or 2004, up at Lake Sonoma that Linda mentioned. In case you don't know where that is, it's about 80 miles north of San Francisco, a little northwest of Healdsburg, the town of Healdsburg. It's a good dark sky site. Uh, I uh, was, I had a 12-inch Schmidt Cassegrain, and I was interested in getting an 18-inch Daub. And Steve was there with an 18-inch Daub and a Star Master, one of the two types of 18 inches I was interested in. So I walked over and introduced myself and asked if I could watch him collimate the scope, since I was, I, I, I wanted to know a little more about that. He, he let me, I watched, and then he also uh, was very helpful. He, uh, he knew someone, a fellow named Dennis Beckley, I've become good friends with, who had an 18-inch obsession, the other type of scope, and I went over to his house and learned about that. So that was uh, very helpful for me. Um, he's observed in multiple you know, sites in California, not just uh, Lake Sonoma, but uh, he's many times visited Australia, done a lot of observing from Australia, and also a few times a year he flies to uh, Texas, uh, Fort, Fort Davis, Texas, <coughs> where there's a fellow named Jimmy Lowry who has a 48-inch scope. It's wow. probably the largest privately owned uh, telescope on the planet. If not, it, any other wouldn't be that much larger. And he's done a lot of observing there, so he's done observing from uh, very small refractor to uh, very large uh, telescopes. Uh, I'm just going to say one other thing, uh, or a couple other things. Uh, I mentioned digital setting circles, in case people don't know what that are, most people would, but in case you don't know, it's a little computer that you can have on your scope, or it might be even better than size. It has a database with all these petals. I hope I'm talking loud enough. Uh, with all these catalogs and uh, objects, and so if you are interested in seeing a particular deep sky object, say NGC 40, which is uh, uh, Bowtie Planetary and Cepheus, you can just punch in the catalog and the number, and with a little screen there, you can push your scope, and it'll tell you when the scope is pointing at that object. Or if you have a motor system, you just hit the go to on the controller, and the scope goes there. Well, uh, Steve has written all these observing notes, and the two leading manufacturers of digital setting circles on the planet uh, make Argonavis and Nexus, those two systems. 
And uh, both of the manufacturers asked Steve if, they, if he would be so kind as to let them use his observing notes. So if you get either of those systems and you go to an object and you want to know something about the object, it's very easy to then go and read a little uh, a section on uh, what about the object that, that are Steve's notes. Um, one other thing, uh, if you do observe, I'll just mention a few things about Steve himself. He's very generous with his time. If you're observing somewhere, I've seen lots of people come up, and now he's got a 24 inch, not a 18. And if you're People come over and ask him questions. He's very helpful telling them about deep sky objects. And if you're observing on the field with him, uh, he'll say to people around that are observing through their own scopes, hey, come on over and look at this. So he's very generous in, in that regard. He does have a website, uh, Adventures in Deep Sky uh, Space, and he probably will mention that. Uh, I think I can say uh, without exaggeration that he's one of the leading observational uh, amateur astronomers in the world, and he happens to live in the Bay Area. So please join me in welcoming uh, Steve Gottlieb. The um, digital setting circles that uh, Bob was mentioning, you can actually see them right here on uh, my telescope, sort of computerized. Uh, it's actually Bob in the back of that person. <laughs> <laughs> we often observe together. This is, this is not at Lake Sonoma, but uh, it might be another star party uh, called CalSTAR, which takes place uh, twice a year, kind of in uh, Central California, uh, near Lake San Antonio. Uh, I think the next one is going to be in April. And this actually is my current telescope, which by amateur standards is quite a large one. Uh, it's a 24 inch. Um, but I have started with a small telescope, like Linda said, and kind of uh, gradually work my way up to a telescope uh, this large and sort of got aperture fever like uh, some people that are some people get anyways and just kind of stuck with it through the years. Um, out of curiosity, how many people do have a telescope in here? Ah, okay. Very good. So um, I, I've been writing for Sky and Telescope for uh, quite a while probably a little over 20 years now, and usually I, I'm one of the couple of editors who, who does gear the articles towards large telescopes, um, which is, I, I would consider, uh, say, 16-inch or larger telescopes. And most of the observations or comments that I'll make in this talk probably will apply to that size telescope, a 16 or 18 inch uh, telescope. So let me get started here. So um, the first part of the talk anyways um, is going to discuss this NGCIC project that uh, Linda mentioned. And the purpose of this project was to answer that question on top. What deep sky objects did our astronomical ancestors um, discover visually before the age of photography in the 18th and 19th century? Um, that would include Charles Messier uh, in Paris, uh, along with his contemporaries, uh, William Herschel, uh, also in the late 18th century, and his son John Herschel in the 19th century, um, and a whole slew of European as well as um, Australian and one or two American astronomers in the late 19th century. Um, 
the way I got involved with this is um, when I first started observing 40 years ago with my uh, smaller telescopes, I was often running across objects that I couldn't identify or in any case uh, either I couldn't identify them, they weren't located where they were supposed to be, um, they uh, <coughs> seemed to have conflicting identifications, and I was just kind of curious um, what the real story was behind the, um, these objects that have NGC designations. I'll talk about that in a minute. And so I started writing, this was before email, and uh, the, the uh, internet was really around. I started writing letters to some professional astronomers who, catalog who were um, compilers of professional catalogs uh, asking questions. And one of them, his name is Harold Corwin, he was at Caltech. He said, well, I'm interested in starting up this project called the NGCIC project and I'd like to have some amateurs involved. And what our goal is going to be, I will have it up here, is to re-examine, re-analyze all the source material that was used to compile the NGC. NGC stands for New General Catalog, which was compiled in 1888. And a couple of follow-up catalogs in 1895. All of these objects were discovered visually, and that really appealed to me to get involved because I was never into photography. I was always enjoyed observing things through a telescope. Um, and he told me that from his experience that a very large percentage, up to a quarter, of all NGC and IC uh, discoveries of which together there's um, close to 13,000 had identification problems. Either they had wrong positions um, in their catalogs, they were duplicates of other objects, they were misidentified in modern catalogs, they were incorrectly classified. One would, so an object was uh, classified as a planetary or a galaxy and it was really something else. Um, and in many cases, some of the objects, even though they're supposed to be um, extra galactic objects like galaxies, nebulae, um, clusters, some of them were just single or multiple stars. So we asked if I wanted to get involved with that and I said, sure, that sounded great. Um, so. A lot of my early research kind of involved going over to the UC Berkeley astronomy department. I lived in Berkeley and had been a grad student there in the math department and I was familiar with the astronomy uh, library there and I would often do my observing and uh, whenever some identification problem came up I would um, go over to UC Berkeley kind of Get, get into the library there and started digging into all the catalogs they had there and because uh, nothing was available online and all of their uh, atlases um, which you'll hear a little bit more about later. But eventually this sort of turned into an internet project where uh, we developed a website and did everything online as catalogs became more and more digitized. So, let me just talk a little bit about the NGC. This is the man who put together the NGC. Uh, he's a uh, Danish-born astronomer who um, actually ended up marrying into a uh, Irish family and uh, ended up living in Ireland. And uh, I think he was the Astronomer Royale of Ireland, actually. And he's the one who compiled the NGC in 1888. Um, it had 7,840 entries. Okay, what are these entries? Well, they're probably more than half of them, well actually, um, 
Yeah, uh, uh, more than half of them were discovered <coughs> by the father and son William Herschel and John Herschel in England uh, with an 18-inch telescope. And that was the size of the telescope that I had. So it really, um, I kind of felt like I was always following in their footsteps when I was observing these objects because they had used the same size telescope that I had. And they included all objects that were known up to 1888, the 7,840. They were all discovered visually. Uh, Dreyer, on the other hand, faced a very daunting task. He had to correlate, compile, all this, this complete uh, disparate collection of observations. By that I mean the observations were made through various telescopes, not just the Herschel's, but there were small refractors. Some of them were discovered with a six-inch telescope others with as large as a telescope that he actually observed on in Ireland in the 1870s, uh, which was a 72-inch telescope that was built by uh, Lord Ross, William Parsons. So there were large telescopes then that were used visually, uh, even larger than um, this 48-inch that um, Bob mentioned that I sometimes observe on in Texas. Um, so he was able to complete this project in one year. He worked pretty quickly with having all these uh, objects that had been discovered by these various astronomers, though there were a few thousand objects that had only been observed one time and uh, were never uh, confirmed. So. Um, this is a list of the various, of the main six people that were involved in this uh, project. The first one is the professional that I kind of mentioned I first got in contact with, uh, just exchange letters, uh, Harold Corwin. He's now retired, but he, worked, he was an astronomer at Caltech. Um, Wolfgang Steinecke is in Germany, and he uh, has a PhD in the history of astronomy. Uh, Brian Skiff started off as an amateur and became a professional at Lowell Observatory. Uh, same thing with Brent Arkinall. He started off as an amateur and um, is actually works uh, for the USGS as an astrogeologist, um, creating maps of other planets. And the last two were kind of visual observers, investigators, including myself. And um, I did a lot of um, digging through old catalogs and observations, um, but I also, as Linda mentioned, reobserved objects that had only been, particularly that had only been observed one time with my own 18-inch telescope the one that Bob saw when we first met. So what, what could we find now uh, over a hundred years later that hadn't been uncovered during that time? Uh, what, what could the investigators, the sort of Astro detectives find out that uh, wasn't already known. Well, um, we went back and looked at the original log books of the various astronomers. Nobody had actually taken the time to do that. Um, fortunately, many of those have been uh, digitized and were available online, but in some cases, people went to observatories and actually found the original log books and read them um, to uncover new information. Um, at the same time, we also found sketches of the objects that were done by some of the astronomers, and that helped give further clues about what objects they actually uh, discovered. Um, the third one says improved positions. Now, um, that's a big one because you might think that um, 
the positions of objects would be well determined and people nowadays could just look up on a photograph or atlas and see what objects were actually discovered. But it's not that simple because often they did not compute accurate positions. They didn't have very good star catalogs, very accurate star catalogs in many cases. And those star catalogs were used to um, estimate the position of the galaxy or whatever deep sky object was actually discovered. Um, we also took the, all the original descriptions, and now nowadays we can compare them with modern images that we have of all the objects to make sure they match up, or if they don't match up, what else the original um, astronomer might have seen. And lastly, I, as Linda mentioned, visually reobserved all the NGCs to compare the old descriptions with my own descriptions, which I took. And those old new descriptions that I took are actually in some of those digital setting circles um, in those little computer boxes that I pointed out at the very, on the very first um, slide that Bob also mentioned uh, when he was introducing me. So let me just kind of start off with one previous attempt to create a modern NGC, New General Catalog, and that was called the RNGC, which came out in the um, late 1970s, and that um, revised New General Catalog was an attempt to provide new descriptions and positions of all the objects in the NGC. And you can see there's a group of galaxies here that's known by Copeland as Copeland's Septet. There are more than, if you, I know if you sit there and count, there are more than um, seven galaxies there, but the brightest seven galaxies, <coughs> probably one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, um, were discovered visually uh, by an astronomer called Ralph Copeland um, and uh, also an Irish astronomer. And um, the RNGC, if you read it, it's still so old, the listings for all these objects, their description is it's non-existent, meaning none of these objects exist. Well, that's ridiculous. There they are. Um, what went wrong and why did they say they didn't exist? Well, the problem is they looked in the NGC and at the position in the NGC there's blank piece of sky. There's nothing there. So it's an invalid NGC position. Well, what happened? Well, Dreyer made a mistake trying to um, estimate the position of these galaxies. They were described as being near a particular red star, though Copeland, who discovered these galaxies, wasn't sure which red star they were near, and <laughs> Copeland had to make a guess and he picked the wrong star. <laughs> so uh, I'm, this is not exactly what happened, but let's say Copeland said these galaxies are one degree east of, this, of a red star. Well, um, they are, but uh, not the red star that Dreyer picked. So at Dreyer's position, there was nothing, and the RNGC said, well, Copeland must have made a mistake, and he must have imagined these objects, must have been hallucinating. They're not there, therefore Clint declared they were non-existent. So we knew that the RNGC was a flawed attempt to update the NGC, and if the NGC position was poor, the RNGC, the revised New General Catalog, either called it non-existent, or if there was some other galaxy near the position, that's the one they picked, whether it was the right one or not. So 
that really wasn't a very good historical solution. Yeah. Well, at that time, of course, they didn't know that these things were extragalactic galaxies. No, no. At the at the time they were at the time the uh, RNGC, of course, and of course in the 1970s, yes, they did. But at the at the time they were discovered, they were just fuzzy nebula. Uh, fuzzy nebulae in the sky. They could have been, um, well, for the, the concept of extragalactic or galactic wasn't even there. They were just nebulae. They had no conception of what distance they were, what the true nature was. Um, and they were classified into different, um, well, into different categories um, by their visual appearance. So, of course, if they were stars, they were classified as a star cluster or a globular, a rich, you know, various types of star clusters. Or if they were a, a fuzzy object like these were, then they were just called nebulae. And there was another class. They, they did recognize planetary nebulae, like the Ring Nebula. And so that was a term that was coined by William Herschel because they kind of look like planets, little disks. Um, but other than that, they had no clue what they are. In fact, the idea of larger and larger telescopes being developed in the 19th century, culminating in this 72-inch telescope, was to see if these kind of fuzzy objects that just look like little patches of gray light could be resolved into individual stars like a star cluster because in a small enough telescope a star a, well even take binoculars a, 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 a cluster of stars may just look like a fuzzy glow right so the idea was to see whether all objects could, all fuzzy objects could be resolved and we know the answer is no so Here's, look, I'm going to get into a little bit more complicated cases, but I'm going to give a few examples here. This is a galaxy in Pisces, NGC 575. So uh, you can see it's, it's called a barred spiral, that vertical uh, kind of bar here that gives it its name, a barred spiral. And um, Dreyer's, um, the discovery position was correct. If you go back, to the logbook of the astronomer, it may have been William Herschel who discovered this, there's nothing wrong with it. He placed it right where it should be. What happened was Dreyer transcribed the position incorrectly by two degrees. So in the NGC, if you look at that position, there's nothing there. But it was just a purely a clerical error. He simply, he had to transcribe 7,840 um, objects into, you know, uh, printable form, and he made a few mistakes. This is one of them, by two degrees. That's enough that you would never find this object in the sky. If you, I mean, it's off by two degrees. That's quite a bit. That's equivalent to uh, four full moons. So what happened was this object was discovered possibly in the late 18th century, but um, it was lost because there's nothing when dry, in Dreyer's position. And then in 1896, another astronomer rediscovered it, found it again, assumed it was new, so it was cataloged, but this time it appeared in another catalog which followed the NGC called the IC which stands for index catalog. So that, this was like a supplement to the NGC. So that's OK. Modern catalogs have always called this object in the um, literature, professional literature, IC1710, because that's the second designation. But for historical integrity, let's call it, it really should be identified as NGC 575 
which assigns credit to William Herschel, who was the original discoverer of this object, instead of the IC designation, which was a later astronomer. So now it is correctly labeled because of the uh, work of, this in, of our NGCIC project. And when I say correctly identified, I mean the, um, the correct identifications have been loaded into professional databases. So not, when amateur, not only amateurs, but when professionals look up the correct identifications um, before writing their papers or whatever, they will see this object is NGC 575. Okay, so now let's get into sort of some examples of like some of our investigations. So there's, forget this object, that this is a galaxy, this little uh, uh, splotch on the, on the star field there. But there are two galaxies here, this one and this one. And this, it's not that far off, but this is where John Herschel, his position is. It's below these two galaxies. So which one did he see? Well, well, first of all, I'll mention that this object's uh, kind of in the southern part of the sky. So it was discovered in South Africa when he took a long sea journey to, um, from England in 18, it was discovered in 1834. He arrived there a couple of years earlier. And this is an example, I thought I would put this up here as an example of the way things are coded in the NGC. This is what Dreyer wrote based on Herschel's description. I'll, do, I'll kind of translate this. EF is extremely faint. PS is pretty small. <laughs> R is round. VLBM is very little brighter in the middle. <laughs> so the center part of the galaxy is a little brighter. And right in the middle, this says stellar nucleus. That means it has a very small, almost like a star, right in the center. Okay? Kind of like this galaxy does right here. It has a little fuzzy, small, bright center or pit, or whatever you might want to call it, right in the center. Well, this is the object that all modern, that all catalogs have assumed to be NGC 6816. And if you looked it up in catalogs previously, that's what you would find. But we looked at Herschel's logbook, or we looked at all the logbooks, and this, besides having this description kind of written out in words, he also included additional information. He said, a star, ninth magnitude of, of the nebula, a, a star ninth magnitude to the north of the nebula at six minutes distance, six arc minutes distance, has what may easily be taken as a nebula attached to it. But it is only a group of very small stars. Well, these lines here are three arc minutes apart. So two of them are actually six. So how do you interpret what he wrote here? Well, it says a star ninth magnitude is to the north of the nebula by six arc minutes. Well, if you look at this nebula, or galaxy, we would call it now, if you look six arc minutes approximately, maybe five, to the north, direct north is straight up, there is a star which is ninth magnitude. And it says also, um, it has what may easily be taken as a nebula attached to it. Well, attached to it, meaning near it. There's the nebula. But he assumed it was only a group of very small stars. 
So he misinterpreted this nebula right here as a group of stars, but his description clearly only applies to this galaxy right here. This is the real NGC 6816. So we reassigned the number from this galaxy to this one, which is the correct one that he discovered. That would be like a common or typical case of a misidentification. How big of a telescope was he using? Um, well, William Herschel and John Herschel both had an 18-inch telescope, which is a large telescope, but it was a was not a glass mirror. It was a speculum metal mirror, which tarnished very quickly, and it had only a pro only about 70% reflectivity. Now that's the primary, and the secondary, of course, was also um, not a glass mirror. It was a, uh, a, a speculum mirror, which is kind of a, uh, a combination of tin and some other uh, material. And it also had 70%. If you multiply that together, that's about 50% reflectivity at the eyepiece. The net result is that 18-inch telescope that he had is probably more equivalent to a 12 to 14-inch telescope, a modern telescope. So you could say it was a 12 to 14-inch telescope. Yeah. So when he says that he measured that with his six odd minutes, right? He was estimating not by having a, 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 um, just eyeballing. eyeballing. So how did he do that? He knew the field of view of his eyepiece. Let's say he knew the field was 15 arc minutes from edge to edge. So it was seven and a half from the center to the edge. And it was slightly less than the distance from the center to the edge. And that's all he could do. He had no wires to actually measure the separation exactly. Or he couldn't take a photograph. <laughs> Photography wasn't invented to be able to measure it later by uh, some device. Yeah? What happened to the designation of the misidentified object? Unfortunately, that no longer, well, many objects appear um, in many later surveys and catalogs. So it has another designation. It gets, it gets a more modern designation. If you detective work and now figure out what that yeah, well, the new one, newer ones, um, yeah, and for, uh, it's like the Messier objects that most people are familiar with. We, that, that was the original designation, so we call something M1, which is the Crab Nebula, just as an example. That's the oldest designation. It actually does have an NGC designation. It's called, it's NGC 1952, but nobody calls it that. They call it the old, the first designation. The, um, the original discovery designation. So this designation no longer applies to this galaxy because it was essentially discovered more recently and that designation is the one that's current, is now used. Did you have to make that correction when this was discovered? No, no, it's just um, other astro astronomers just did that. Um, so, um, here is, uh, gets, I'm getting a couple more examples. These are a little bit more complicated cases. Um, there's three NGC numbers here. 6196, 6197, 6199. And the circles here, this is where the astronomer Albert Marth placed them in 1864. Well, there's nothing there, there's nothing there, there's nothing there. Okay. Later, in 1886, this uh, Bigourdan, uh, a French astronomer, reobserved this field. And he said, well, I can't find these objects. They're not there. There's nothing over there. But I do see an object here, an object here, and an object here. He recataloged them. With, and they were given IC, index catalog, like supplementary 
catalog designations after the NGC, and those were the designations that they people used uh, since then. That's what they, these three galaxies have been known by. Well, if you plot these positions on the sky, this is a, uh, a photograph from the Palomar Sky Survey that I'll talk about later. Um, if you look at 6196 and you kind of offset it by a certain distance, horizontally and vertically, I just took this arrow here and I copied it and pasted it here and pasted the arrow here over here. You can see that this position, well, maybe it applies to this object or maybe it doesn't. It could apply to this one, but if you do the very similar offset from this position, you come to this galaxy. Okay? Well, why did he, you might say, okay, and if you, the weird thing is if you take the offset and apply it here, it actually points to this faint star. It doesn't point to a galaxy. Now you might say, well, why, how, that might not be right. What about this guy right here? Well, I reobserved these three galaxies with my 18-inch telescope, and it turns out that visually this galaxy is fainter than the other two. So it's very plausible the original astronomer, Albert Marth, did see these two galaxies, and it's not, it's not at all unexpected that he missed this one. And he apparently just made a mistake on this one. Why do I, this arrow where I wrote wrong NGC 6199, remember I said the RNGC often just picked a nearby object and said, well, let's call this object a certain number. Well, they call this object, it actually is a galaxy, it looks like a star, but they said, let's call this NGC 6199. And I remember when I looked at this object at Berkeley on the Palomar Sky Survey, I couldn't believe that Albert Marth could have possibly seen it. It's so tiny and faint, as you can see on this image here, that I knew something was wrong. And that was one of the initial objects that kind of got me involved in this project. Here's another interesting case, Lewis Swift, who is a famous um, famous American astronomer, uh, discovered lots of comets, including Swift Tuttle, uh, which is responsible for the Perseid meteor shower. And he observed, um, almost till 80 years old, it, unfortunately, his last few years, he made a lot of mistakes. He just <laughs> wasn't too sharp his last few years. So, there's two galaxies here. This is, not, this is much more detail than you would have seen in the eyepiece. These, of course, are deep photographs. But he discovered these two galaxies at the age of 77 four times on four <laughs> different nights during the summer. Each time he measured the position, he came up with such a disparate position from the previous time and couldn't remember that he had seen them the previous time, that every couple of weeks he rediscovered the object and recorded it as new and published it even as new four times. Well, Dreyer took these objects, the positions were so different, he assumed they all referred to different galaxies. But we now know by looking at his descriptions, they differed by up to four degrees, which is quite a bit. We now know that this galaxy was, was cataloged by Dwyer four different times, all, all due to the four observations by Lewis Swift and four times uh, this one over here. And it has four different designations. You can pick which one is right. They're all correct. The thing that makes most sense is to use the designation which was the original discovery, the first one, which I'm not even sure. By the way, he observed with a 16-inch refractor 
He had a 16-inch refractor, and he observed in um, Rochester, New York. That telescope actually ended up coming to California. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering which one of the uh, observations was closest to the actual position. Oh, which one of these four? Yeah. Off the top, I'd have, I, I, off the top of my head, I don't know. I'd have to look it up to see which ones. None of them were right on. Like the closest one might have been like like a half a degree away or something. He made lots of mistakes. In fact, of his last, I don't know, maybe 50 objects he discovered, he was pretty prolific, 50 objects he discovered, probably 40 of them were lost, meaning the positions were so bad nobody could find them afterwards. Um, so, and then he quit. But, um, we will hear a little bit more about him and his son a little later on. Um, okay, and uh, another example. There's two NGC numbers, 2363, 2366. Here they are. But if you look, there's really, on this photograph, there's really three galaxies. There's one here, one here, and what looks like a pretty dim one right here. And it's been assumed that this is 2363, and this is 2366, okay? But let's look at the descriptions, the original logbook descriptions. 2366, which is assumed to be this one, it's described as very faint and small. Well, actually, that's not very small. That's the biggest one. 300 magnification or power confirmed it, confirmed that it was not a star. So it means it was very small that he needed that high of a power and showed a very faint branch to the northeast. Well, here I put in the directions here. Northeast would be in that direction. Well, look at that object right there. If you look to the northeast, which is this way, you can see there's a what he called a very faint branch, meaning there's a very faint glow to the northeast. Ah, so that must be the real 2366. Well, what's 2363? Well, this is how it was described in the logbook. Diffuse nebulosity due west. West is to the right. And then he's giving the direction with respect to this object. So due west is right here. Distance, and he even gives the distance, 1.2 arc minutes. And if you measure the separation here, I don't have a scale, but that matches perfectly that object. So we now know that this is the real 2363, this is the real 2366, and the modern, and the identifications in the RNGC were incorrect. And finally, I want to mention a strange situation. All the objects in the NGC and IC are supposed to be <coughs> objects outside our solar system. They might be in our galaxy, they might be clusters of stars, globular clusters, planetaries, or they might be extragalactic galaxies, essentially. But there is one object in the IC, 2120, which has been assumed to be this nebula, it kind of looks like a planetary nebula right here. This is the catalog designation. It's in uh, Auriga, Auriga, and it's, it's a ways away from the IC position, 40 minutes southwest. But that's what it's always been taken to be. But there's a strange story. The discoverer, B. Gordon, which I mentioned before, a French astronomer, he observed a comet in his logbook in 1890. Okay, that's the name of the comet, Spitaler, um, Spitale, I don't know, 7. Um, on December 8, 1890, he goes back to the field two hours later to remeasure it and see how much it's moved. Because why would he do that? Well, because when you're able to follow the direction and rate that a comet is moving, you can determine 
have, through enough observations, its orbit, its, its um, uh, how it's going to cro cross the skies. But he puts that in his logbook. But unfortunately, he goes back later to write up a catalog of new objects he's discovered. He finds this second observation. He forgets that it refers to the comet, and he reports it as a new nebula. He, so in other words, that was the whole point of the Messier catalog, of course, was to um, uh, produce a catalog so that astronomers looking for fuzzies like this, uh, were, uh, people looking for comets weren't confused by fuzzies like this, which are not comets. Well, he does find a comet and essentially calls it a nebula. Okay, so um, we figured out, we went back to that exact date, December 8th, recomputed the position of the comet on that particular date and time, and his position is right on, not this object, but right on the position of the comet on the evening of December 8, 1890. So this, this is not an IC object. That's the correct designation. It stands for Minkowski 2-3. But IC 2120, uh, unless this comet is a short period comet that's going to return, uh, this is not an IC object you're going to observe because it was a comet, uh, not a uh, galaxy. It's the only comet that has an NGC or IC designation, as a matter of fact. So, um, what's been the result? Um, the NGC IC project has recovered hundreds of mistaken identities, uh, objects that were lost, other mysteries, uh, no one knew what the, what the objects were, um, that really created a lot of confusion in both in professional databases and software used by amateurs. And all the results now have been incorporated into professional databases that are online that astronomers use and amateur software. And I've listed Sky Safari Pro, Starry Nights, SkyX, different um, soft, various software packages that um, amateurs use, including some of those digital setting circles like the Nexus. Um, and the Nexus actually has my observing notes in it also. So I wrote an article on this uh, when we were still working on this project back in 2003, kind of a summary of a lot of the stuff I just showed you with a lot more background on the NGC. I think I'm going to take some time now to discuss some of the ar other articles I've written um, for Sky Telescope. Um, uh, this astronomer at the back end of the telescope, oh, this is actually Schmidt camera at Mount Palomar. That's George Abel or Abel um, and when he was a graduate student uh, at Caltech. And he was a uh, he was the observer for one of the observers, two main observers, on the Palomar Sky Survey, which took place in the 1950s. It was an all-sky, um, wide-field survey of every of the entire sky visible from uh, Mount Palomar in Southern California. And this in the early 1950s. And he had, since he was, he took the uh, photos and developed the, uh, looked at the plates. Um, and he was also, part of his duties was to check that the plates came out good, they were, the guiding was good, there wasn't any <coughs> asteroids or, or airplane trails that crossed the, the plates. And um, so he got first dibs on looking at them. And while he was looking at the Palomar Sky Survey, he started making a list of interesting planetary nebula that he found, and he came up with 73 by 1955. Um, and these are now, these are not in the NGC or IC. All these 
there's a, well, almost exclusively, there's one or two exceptions that because of mistakes, they should have been in the NGC or they were just misidentified. Um, these planetaries in general um, tend to be very large, highly evolved planetaries, old planetaries that have a low surface brightness. And so they were a little too dim to just, so Herschel missed them. But an amateur nowadays with an oxygen-free filter, a uh, specialized filter that only lets through the light of, of um, doubly ionized oxygen uh, that planetaries uh, emit are able to see many of these objects. So this is like an example. This is Apollo 39 in Hercules, a very beautiful symmetric planetary. It's three arc minutes across. It's a very old, large one. I wanted to mention the diameter here, 5.5 light years. Um, the typical size of a planetary nebula is about one light year. This one has been expanding so long. It's now very faint. It doesn't look that way necessarily in that picture, but it's very dim and it's five light years across. What's five light years? Well, that's like, uh, that's um, further than the distance to the nearest star. So <laughs> all the way to Alpha Centauri, what is it? It's like twice the distance. No, no, it's, but it's one and a half times. Yeah, four, about four. So this is beyond the, uh, we go out all the way from one end of it, if uh, the sun was out here, uh, you know, Alpha Centauri would be out here somewhere. So this object is faintly visible. I've seen it in my 18 inch with a filter. Here's another one. This is in Sagittarius. Uh, I kind of nicknamed it Peanut in a Shell. The peanut is because of these little indentations sort of on the side, and it's kind of a dim shell around it, and that's the, this object's interesting in that it was originally classified as a galaxy, it was misclassified, it has a unique double shell appearance like that, and it's not too difficult of an object in an 18 inch, it kind of looks like a boxy oval. And this is the third one, this one's in Aquila, uh, and the designation is almost 70, and this is unusual, you can see there, is something bright, right on the top of it. Well, that is a background galaxy that is at a distance of 250 million light years, 10,000 times as distant as the planetary right here. This is the central star of the planetary. 10,000, this almost looks like it's in front, I know. But this is 10,000 times as far away this is in our own galaxy. This is a distant galaxy right here. And it also has a binary um, central star. This looks like a single star, but uh, two stars very close together. And the planetary is visible with a filter. And without a filter, the galaxy shows up as a little brighter spot, slightly brighter spot right on the rim. And, um, I like to call it the diamond ring because it kind of, you don't really see these extensions. You just see a kind of a bright spot like a little diamond on a ring here. Well, we're back to George Abel. This is when he was teaching at UCLA. He's a professor there, educated for many, many years. He also discovered many galaxy clusters and, um, in fact, wrote his PhD dissertation on rich galaxy clusters. He discovered a few thousand of them on the Palomar Sky Survey, 2,712 <coughs> clusters of galaxies. The nearest cluster to us is the Virgo cluster. Um, these are even richer clusters. And he classified them based on how large they were, uh, how many galaxies, how rich they were, etc. Here's a couple of examples. That's these are all individual galaxies here, but there are some stars. That's a star, that's a star, that's a star right there. But a lot of these objects in this field are galaxies. 
Hercules and Hercules. It's kind of a little bit of an unusual galaxy cluster um, because about half of them are spirals. In many galaxy clusters, the majority are elliptical galaxies like this. They just look like um, round spheres. This is one of the most distant clusters you can see in a 12 to 14 inch telescope. It's a half a billion light years away. And I have seen a total, not just in this field here, but further out in all directions. There's galaxies I have logged 36, three dozen galaxies and wrote about it in 2003. This is another rich galaxy cluster in Corona Borealis. You can see, except for these two bright reddish stars here, and maybe one here, just about every other object you can see in this picture is a galaxy. Um, it has over 400 members. Um, and it's, it's been called the most difficult object for amateur telescopes. That was a quote taken from the handbook of the uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada that they produce a yearly book. It's, it's one billion light years away, and it's the most distant cluster that is visible in an 18-inch telescope. I'm talking about a very dark sky. And I did see six of them back in the um, 1990s and wrote about it um, from, by, from Hotel, I think, actually, and did write about it in um, May 2000, Sky and Tell. Um, this is actually a cluster of clusters called a supercluster. It's a chain. It's actually one cluster, but this continues um, way off that image. Um, it's a second order clustering in a sense, and it includes several able galaxy clusters and it's spread out over 40 degrees in the sky at a, a distance of 250 million light years. And all together in all these clusters, I've logged a few hundred of galaxies. Most of them just look like fuzzy patches. That was back in January 2001, I wrote the article. Um, there was also galaxies that were fainter, excuse me, globular clusters, not galaxies, globular clusters that are called Palomar clusters. And those were discovered also on the Palomar Sky Survey. And ter uh, Tergen clusters were discovered by this astronomer. Um, Abel published a list of 13 globulars himself. And this guy discovered 11 globulars in the near infrared that had been missed previously because they were obscured by dust. So these are very faint globulars, again, that were not discovered in the 19th century. Um, two of them are kind of interesting because they're thought to have been globulars that are considered part of the Milky Way but were originally part of another galaxy, a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way called the Sagittarius, Sagittarius Dwarf. So this is one example, Palomar 8. And our friend George discovered it in the early 1950s. Uh, but actually, doing research, <laughs> I looked at the Lick archives and discovered that E.E. E. Barnard um, discovered it visually in 1889, never published the discovery, so probably doesn't deserve credit because he didn't publish it. Um, with a 12-inch refractor up on Mount Hamilton in San Jose, and even said it was likely GC globular cluster. Um, Barnard was a fantastic visual uh, observer, famed for having uh, <coughs> fabled eyes. And in 1892, uh, he discovered Adolfia, one of the closest uh, one of the closest moons of Jupiter visually at Lick. It was the last moon that was discovered visually. All, there's many moons have been discovered in the um, uh, 20th century and in the 21st century, but all on, um, uh, not visually, all on 
um, photographs or CCD images or etc. Um, so I wrote an article on this back in November 2020. Uh, so, oh, excuse me, I'm go I am writing an article <laughs> that actually <laughs> it hasn't been published yet. Getting ahead of yourself. <laughs> but I am, the article, the focus of the article is actually going to be on Barnard's discoveries that he never published. So his, un his unknown discoveries that were made at Lick Observatory uh, with this 12-inch refractor. Um, let's see, how am I doing time-wise, Linda? Do I have 10 minutes or not? Okay, so here's a Russian, I thought I'd, let's go to a Russian astronomer. Uh, this is Vorontsov Velyaminov. He published one of the earliest catalogs from the Palomar Sky Survey. Uh, called the Atlas and Catalog of Interacting Galaxies. So he was interested in pairs of galaxies that appear to be interacting. And this catalog has 355 systems or pairs. And Halton Arp, who has spoken, spoke to the SFAA a couple of times when he was alive, he was, um, he was inspired by this atlas to come up with his own atlas of peculiar galaxies. And most of the BB galaxies are visible in an 18-inch telescope. This is one of them. Uh, this pair, it's an interacting pair. That's what the catalog is. It's two um, spiral galaxies in Pegasus. They collided 20 million years ago. And it, it's hard to see it, but on, particularly on radio emission maps, it appears the two galaxies are connected like strands of taffy, and so they're actually called the taffy galaxies. And I wrote an article on the BBs back in, now, this is September 2014. Here's another one. This is a famous uh, Hubble image. It's called Hubble's Rose, VB323. It's in Andromeda. And there's two, oops, let me go back. There's two galaxies. This galaxy here has dropped through the, first, the top galaxy and caused a burst of new star formation that's visible as these blue um, glowing blobs here. And um, these two galaxies are visible in the 18 inch telescope. They're there. Um, they don't look like that, but you can see them. And I wrote an article on these, the same article as the previous one. And this is the last one. It's a summer pair, VB102. And these are really close to merging into a single galaxy. They're actually con conjoined. And they are only 35,000 light years apart. And they'll merge. And here's Art, who was famous, well, iconoclast, because he <laughs> felt he didn't believe in the standard interpretations of redshifts indicating galaxy distances. And he felt that quasars were nearby. That's been discarded now. but. He also created a famous uh, atlas that included peculiar galaxies that have rings, what he called jets, injected material. Most astronomers wouldn't call them injected material now, but tidal tails would be a more common name. So this is an example. This galaxy was discovered not by the 70 seven-year-old Edward, I'm sorry, Lewis Swift, but by his son, who was 14 years old <laughs> at the time. He helped his father. He was his assistant. So he discovered these two galaxies here, here and here. And visually, they look a little more distinct. It is very unusual. Art would say this is ejected, 
we call it a tidal tail from gravitational interaction. This is new stars forming, this sort of blue region in the middle. This article I wrote about observations through that 48 inch. That was a couple years ago. Here's another one. It's called the Penguin and Egg. Hmm. Penguin and Egg. And um, see this blue streak? Well, Art said that streak was ejected from this interaction. That's how we interpret it. But turns out this galaxy is actually in the foreground. It's only 70% the distance of the other two. So we know it's not part of the interaction. This, by the way, this is dust crossing the top galaxy. <clears throat> this is one of the most gorgeous images, Hubble image, kind of an iconic Hubble image, the antenna, two galaxies in Corvus. This is one core, this is the other. And these galaxies approached and interacted with each other uh, 250 million years ago, according to models. Of course, we weren't around for that. And all of this red pink stuff are new star clusters that formed. I was fortunate, ha had the opportunity to view this galaxy um, a few months, well, earlier this year in an 82 inch professional telescope at, in Texas. And we were able to count 16 individual knots around the periphery of this galaxy, e even more than you really can see or count on photograph. Um, let me, I'm going to skip the triplets. And let me just talk about flat galaxies. This is a Armenian astronomer. Um, and Karen Shensev, Karen Shenseva, Valentina, and she, from the Palomar Sky Survey, she compiled a list of flat galaxies. What's a flat galaxy? We would call it an edge on, edge on silo. Um, and she compiled over 4,000 of them. Okay. Um, there, there are even flatter ones called super thins. And there, you'll see some pictures. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. You'll see some pictures of them. They're gas-rich spirals, no bulge, no dust light. So here's an example. And this is the catalog designation. Flat Galaxy Catalog 1379. Um, it's in Coma Berenices. And it is visible. I observed it in 18 inch. It just looks like a thin sliver, like a little needle in the sky, over 10 to 1 between the long axis versus the small, short, minor axis. And wrote an article in Sky and Tell in 2011. Look how flat this thing is. It's a real pancake in Coma Berenices with an axial ratio of 17, 17 to 1. OK? Um, and I think I'll just mention this last thing here. This is Paul Hickson. He did compact groups. <coughs> and these are groups of at least four galaxies. And this is Stephen's Quintet in Pegasus, five galaxies. Well, where are the five? Yeah. One, two, three, four. These are seven galaxies. Five. Okay, but, and that's the number, Hickson Compact Group 92. But this galaxy right here is actually in the foreground. 
Hickson didn't know that. But um, redshift shows this is closer than the other ones. And you can see by it's actually resolved better into stars than the other ones. And it is closer. It's really a quartet. And I wrote an article in May 99. This is another compact group, probably the most compact group, called Sefer Sextet. Um, this is in serpents, six galaxies. Well, Seifert called it six. One, two, three, four, five. And he thought this was a galaxy. But turns out this one is really an extension of a tidal plume of gas thrown out from this galaxy. You can sort of see a little extension here. And so this is really gas and stars thrown out from this. This is not a separate galaxy. That brings it down to one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that one loses one also. And let's end with Copeland's septet that I showed at the very beginning. Copeland observed on this 72-inch telescope, and he found seven galaxies. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Even the 72-inch did not show this galaxy or this one. There's really nine in this image, but Copeland discovered seven of them visually. They were all claimed to be non-existent, but we, through our work on the NGCIC project, were able to put the correct labels on each one of the NGC galaxies that you see here. And that's what they're currently known by. I have actually glimpsed all seven in a, with my 18-inch scope. So I think I'll stop at this point uh, in the presentation. Yeah, anyone have questions? Yeah. I don't know if there's any explanation for the origin or evolution of the flat galaxies. Um, okay, well, the um, they are a certain class of galaxies, um, a, a class of spirals that are called. The, the spirals come in different flavors, so they're like called SC and SD spirals. Um, they have very small central cores and very wide open spiral arms and they're, they don't have very large bulges in the middle. Um, so if you've seen some galaxies that kind of look like two pi tins, I mean edge on, kind of with a central part that bulges. So it looks like a frisbee, two frisbees, you know. And these galaxies don't have those central bulges, obviously. So this is this is your typical edge on, you know, like here where they look like a spindle or they look um, larger in the center. These galaxies, they're exactly edge on. So you're seeing them, of course, 90 degrees to our line of sight. And they, you're essentially, if you notice these galaxies, this galaxy kind of has a, it's hard to see it, but kind of has a slightly brighter um, central axis without much of a halo around it. And I mean, with, with a halo around it, the bright yeah. halo. But what you're seeing in those super flat ones is just that brighter central axis without that halo of stars around it. Yeah. Uh, is the NGC frozen at 7,840 yes. objects? 7,840. It was originally put in order of RA right. from 0 to 24 hours mm -hmm. for, for, for the epic uh, 1880. Okay. Now it's out of order. <laughs> so yes. like the end of the catalog, like 7,800, mm -hmm. is now it's like, let's say it's in Andromeda, and it's zero hours now. So the end of the old NGC is, in a sense, 
now has an RA that would technically, if it was cataloged today, put it at the beginning of the catalog, not the end. So but no one adds to it today. So is that due to uh, precession? Yeah, due to precession. Okay. But it's just like Messier's catalog. Right. It, it's an historical catalog. Right. No one's going to add to it at this point. Right. Unless it was discovered, and all of a sudden there's some old notes that show Messier discovered something that no one knew about. Maybe we'd add an extra number, but that's the only reason. And then, uh, let's see, how many objects are in the IC catalog? 5,000, and there's two ICs technically. One was 1895, the other one I think was 1907. Okay. That has about 5,700. The, so, the two of them together? No, just the IC. But most of the IC, the majority of it, was discovered after the advent of photography. Okay. And of that 5,700, probably 4,000 of them were discovered photograph on photographic plates, I see. not visually. Okay. They don't quite have the same interest to me. Okay. And how many how many revisions uh, of the uh, NGC have there been? Well, nobody went. The very first one that tried to do a modern revision was that flawed R NGC. Right. There was then, nothing. There was nothing really that was before that. Okay. Then um, then uh, then there was one by Ryder Sinnott. Oh, yes, NGC 2000. 2000. Yeah, okay, so that was pretty good. He then provided, that provided, the RNGC was only the NGC. Okay. The Roger Sinnott's um, uh, book was both NGC and IC. I see. But he didn't have the time or um, ability, as we did as a team, to do all this historical research. Okay. okay. So. Um, it's it's a, it's not bad, and it's better than the RNGC right, right. or the NGC. And it was available. It was the first one that was computerized, yes. and you actually could get probably those on old either floppy disks or CDs. One of the two. And if I may ask one more question: is, If I buy if, if if we buy a go-to telescope nowadays, yeah, which NGC? You would, you, would get, uh, you would get an updated one from the, uh, NG, the uh, NGCIC project. I see. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Karen? Is there a list somewhere, um, if I don't have any of that software, uh, that is... Well, okay, so my, yeah, so on, on my website, um, you can download the, um, actually, you can download my, all the entire NGC, including all the, all the data like positions, magnitude, size, all that, as well as my observing notes, as well as all the historical documentation of why we know that's the correct object. And the website's, you just Google adventures in deep space, okay. um, you'll get it. Because it's, it's more than Mary adventures in deep space dot um, com. There's, there's a prefix to it. Because okay. it's hosted on another server. So I can, um, but if you Google it, you'll get it. Yeah. yeah. Were any errors that you tracked down due to actual motion of the object? No, because the motion of any of these ob objects, as long as they're not solar system objects, star clusters, planetaries like I showed images of, extra galactic objects, galaxies, in a few hundred years, the motion is not detectable. So that wouldn't make any difference. There is something called precession, so that, but that's just a mathematical, that has to do with the fact that the coordinate system is um, based on a system that relies on um, north and south of the celestial equator. That's defined by the axis of the polar axis of the Earth pointing in space. And uh, because the Earth precession processes like a spinning top, the whole coordinate system actually changes slowly. So the coordinate system follows the Earth. Correct. Right. Uh, well, yeah, it follows the precession of the, of the equinoxes.
Yeah. What about the uh, third edition of the Uranometria and the second edition of SCAD, the 2000 of those had? Yeah, so at, we were doing this project as the, um, those atlases came out. The more recent one, like the second edition of the Uranometria, it has two versions. There's an older one, but the newer one that's sold nowadays, um, that data is very accurate. There were more corrections made after that, but that's pretty that's essentially accurate. A lot of, I worked on that, that atlas, and made corrections to it. I was one of the reviewers, so a lot of corrections were made. Yeah, Michael. One of your slides referred to two galaxies soon to merge. Oh yeah, soon. <laughs> probably. Um, yeah, I'm sure you're probably talking about tens of millions of years or something. <laughs> um, yeah, not 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 thousands of years. Um, there's a you know slow dance uh, uh, that um, takes a while. You know, as you know and. For example, and the Andromeda galaxy is heading towards us. It has a negative radial velocity. That we, so it literally is heading towards the Milky Way. And will at one, at one point eventually um, interact and essentially have a collisionless collision where the stars are not exactly going to bang into each other. But eventually we will merge. But who knows, that could take hundreds of millions, if not a few billion years, for the final, the finally coalesce. Plenty of time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it appears um, that uh, galaxy interaction and merging is something that's uh, quite typical. And yeah, as a matter of fact, it's not just something that it happens to be going on with a few select objects at this point in time we see in space, but even our own galaxy was built up. We, it's hard to see the evidence of it, but it's now being uncovered actually nowadays. We're being able to analyze streams of stars in our halo that clearly were extragalactic in origin. Um, so our galaxy was built up through mergers of smaller nearby galaxy, dwarf galaxies, um, to create a larger spiral. So our galaxy, and our galaxy has a couple of nearby satellites called the Magellanic Clouds um, that are visible in the Southern Hemisphere. And those, those galaxies, they're galaxies, not clouds, that's just their name, they will eventually merge with the Milky Way galaxy. So it's happened in the past, it's happening currently, and it will happen in the future. All those things. Okay.